Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see and hear me properly. Uh, my name is Steve Child, and I'm one of the uh, lecturers in operations management at Plymouth Business School. Um, and I'm just here to chair this uh, last of the action workshop sessions this afternoon. So we've got uh, uh, an hours uh, session, uh, and this afternoon's speaker uh, is Emma Burlow, who is from uh, the uh, Lighthouse, uh, I've forgotten, the Lighthouse thing, Lighthouse thing that's just disappeared off my screen. I'm so sorry about that. Um, Lighthouse Sustainability, uh, who is going to talk about a subject which I think is very important, which is about uh, the circular economy in SMEs. And one of the things that's important about action is that I think that um, we've heard a lot about the problems of climate change, um, global warming, heating that come from the scientists, and now it's down to uh, the industrial and business community to actually do something about that, because everything that we do is managed th with businesses and every product that we use uh, comes from a business. So uh, it's time for action in that case. And so let me introduce Emma to talk about circular economy. Emma, it's over to you. Great, thanks ever so much for that introduction. Yeah, so I'm Emma. Um, I run my own small consultancy called Lighthouse, here to really help businesses um, adopt more sustainable business models and particularly I've got a background in circular economy so um, I know it's a graveyard shift we're all keen to get away from the weekend but thanks to those who have joined um, today I'm just going to try and take you through a, it will be quick um, it will be you know a rattle through really the the why and what of, and how of circular economy so sort of the why bother but I'm really keen to get down to the business models and how that relates to SMEs I've got a background working with SMEs. I've always worked with businesses. For about 25 years, I've been supporting businesses with uh, their sustain sustainability challenges and helping them navigate, if you like, what is now a very broad and complex topic. Um, but we're going to focus down on circular economy today. Um, hopefully, lots of time for you to ask some questions. Um, but I think we're going to start straight away with a poll. So if you could load the first poll, please. And I need the question. So the first poll, uh, when it appears, will be, do you feel ready to move your business to a more circular economy? So this is really just trying to gauge your awareness levels and your confidence levels. So let's see when that comes up. Do you feel ready to move your business to a more circular economy? I'm hoping that poll's going to appear at any moment. And you should have four to choose from there. I can't actually see it at the moment, Emma. Oh, is it not popping up? <laughs> no, I'm not quite sure what we need to do there. I think Louise was uh, trying to load that. We'll just carry on, don't worry. We can always come back to it if, if Louise can sort it in the background. So why do we need a more circular economy? We really wanted to start with how we got here to this point. So post-war, back in the 50s, um, we really went through a phase of, of uh, kind of release, if you like, and, and liberty. And one of the things that fueled that was uh, the plastic and consumable um, economy. So why did we do that? We really needed to kickstart the economy after after World War II and resources were cheap, oil was cheap. So we moved very much into this period of mass consumption and what we now term a linear economy. So fast forward throughout the 60s and 70s, innovation, more and more oil-based um, economies growing around the world. And we've hit a bit of a hiatus, really. So we've, we've got a few problems uh, cropping up and um, I've just highlighted two on the screen here but you'll all be aware of more in terms of biodiversity 
um, inequality um, and, and that sort of thing. So how did we get to this point? So this is a quite an interesting graph that shows carbon emissions over the last uh, couple of centuries. And the area in um, orange shows that we've actually emitted more carbon into the atmosphere, 51% of the total, uh, since 1990, so a mere 30 years, than we did in all of sort of industrial civilization before that, so from 1751 on this graph. And that is really quite a shocking statistic and really does put in stark reality kind of how did we get to this point? So I'm not gonna to talk too much about climate change today, but I do want people to understand that circular economy and climate change are, are inextricably linked. Um, so we've got to this point uh, by using oil-based fuels and a linear, linear economy, which is a take, make, dispose economy, and not really thinking about the consequences. OK, so as we've started to sort of wake up to this realisation, we know we've got an imminent climate change crisis on our hands. We need to reverse this trend. OK, so interestingly, the two graphs, we go back, kind of mirror each other. So over the next 30 years, we need to halve greenhouse, emission, greenhouse gases every decade. And any of you that have been on any of the talks over the last couple of days may have looked at this in a bit more detail. From an SME point of view, this is starting to talk about net zero and how this affects your business. So really quite drastic changes that need to happen. Um, interestingly, it is understood that we can only achieve about 55% of the carbon reductions that we need through energy. So that's your wind farms, your solar, your carbon capture, even things like switching to electric vehicles, switching diets, that sort of thing. So the common things that people talk about are only going to get us so far. And that's because there's a lot of carbon embodied in product. And by product, I mean buildings, I mean roads, I mean food. Um, so there's a lot of what we call embodied carbon. And the only way we can reduce this embodied carbon is through the circular economy, is by making those products last longer, keeping them in, in, um, in use longer, um, and then recycling them before they are discarded. So there's a theme here about slowing the flow, slowing things down um, and keeping things in use longer. OK, so that's really important. If you remember nothing else from today, try and remember this pie chart. And when people talk about climate change, say, ah, yeah, I know all about the energy stuff. But actually, the circular economy, I also need to know about that. And how does that affect me and my business? So. What is the circular economy? And I'm not too aware of your level of um, awareness because we didn't get to do the poll, but I'll just run through the theory very quickly and then hopefully you'll be able to come over to some Q&A. So I would encourage you as I'm going through this next couple of sets of slides to chuck some questions in the Q&A if you can, please. So what is the circular economy? I'm just getting a message through uh, Louise to say that the poll is covering the slides. Has that been resolved now? I'm just going to wait to see that it's been resolved. OK, I'm going to carry on. I'm not getting any messages from the team to say that you can see the slides. If someone could just let me know in the chat, that would be great. Great. Thanks very much, Andre. Um, so what is circular economy? Really about deliberately redesigning the way we do things. So I talked about this linear pathway, which was the take, make, dispose model. We're needing to think now about end of life. We're needing to think more about restoration. And actually, we've gone past the point of conservation and we're having to think now about regeneration. So lots of terms there. But the principle is we've made a big mess and we can't just stop where we are. We actually need to regenerate it. 
really important at the moment when we're talking about resilience. So you will have seen a lot of news about supply chains and about COVID and the impact that had. Circularity or circular economy can really start to have a very big impact on resilience. So it's not just environment, it's not just carbon. It starts to really um, work for us when we're starting to get more value um, out of our supply chains. So just a couple of simple ways of looking at this isn't a simple way, but this is the sort of grandfather slide for circular economy. It's sometimes called the butterfly diagram. Um, it's produced by Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So they produce a lot of theory and policy kind of guidance around circular economy. So these the two sides of this butterfly, one is the biological and one is the technical. And if you think of the biological as being uh, the planet, the biosphere, if you like, um, all the biological systems that work that we work within and then the technical side of that which is really our kind of our human um, imprint on the planet so the, the the use of of materials of chemicals of services of systems and so when you work towards um, the middle of that diagram that's really where you want to be that's keeping the value uh, at, at its highest point at the bottom you have energy recovery and landfill which is effectively leakage it's effectively waste so that's where we were, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. An easier way, if people want something they can sort of use to explain to people, is a couple of quick diagrams. The one on the left is linear and it shows the waste and all sorts of things coming out, almost um, sometimes called this the leaky diagram. So, so if, you, if you're familiar with lean or anything like that, then um, this is where waste is being created in the system. And you'll see there are no cycles. There is nowhere to get that waste back in. So something like polystyrene, for example, you take it out of the ground as oil, you make stuff out of it, you use it and you dispose of it. Um, unless you are in a closed loop recycling system, something like polystyrene or PVC, that can only become pollution. So there's no way of, of doing that. So you have to start to redesign products so that they don't leak out of the system. They have a way of, of being kept in use. Okay. Finally, a nice little cartoon um, illustration takes the linear economy, um, the recycling economy, which most of us are start starting to be familiar with, and the circular economy. And the reason I, I put this one up is because people, a lot of people think that the circular economy is all about recycling. Um, but if you remember back to the butterfly diagram, recycling is actually on the out, outside of that. So recycling is really useful and really helpful, but it doesn't keep all of the materials in play for long enough. So there are losses in recycling. It obviously requires energy to be put in, quality degrades. A lot of recycling is downcycling. So you get things like pl plastic bottles made into park benches or bins or whatever. They can't be recycled again. So some recycling keeps things really high up, but a lot of it is downcycling. And you'll know if you've ever looked at sort of plastic statistics, that the vast majority of, of things like plastic are not recycled. Lots and lots of economic reasons for that. So the circular economy is taken to say actually that reuse is the next recycle. So that's about keeping things at a higher value for longer. Okay, so the three basic principles then, looking at regenerating natural systems, and this is the one out of the three that most businesses don't necessarily pay attention to because they feel that it's it's not you know so relevant to them but we have to remember that we operate within a natural ecosystem every business every product every resource comes from that natural ecosystem so if we ignore that as we have done then we end up with the problems that we that we're seeing now so as we go around clockwise we need to start to design out waste and pollution sounds easy you look at a product it can be taking that product right back to the start and actually saying, do we even need that product? Could we have a service instead? And I'll come on to lots of examples about that in a minute. Um, and then essentially, um, you know, designing out things that can't be recovered. So I made the example of um, EPS, polystyrene can be recovered, but it rarely is because of cost. PVC can be recovered, but there are lots of materials, particularly multi-materials that cannot be recovered. And so they can only become pollution. So, and by pollution, I mean energy from waste, which creates carbon or landfill or worse. So lots and lots of economies in the world, countries in the world don't have waste treatment. So any any waste, that is, uh, any product that is sold there can only be 
dealt by burning or burying. So starting to design those things out um, on a, a, a materials level, or actually the area I work most in is on a business models level, um, is really key to this. So it's keeping that in mind. And then the bottom one is the, the, the principle of keeping things and materials in use. So if you start to talk about single use products, they are designed for one use only and often a very short use. So um, a stirrer for coffee, for example, um, a spoon, a plate, a bowl, disposable items that are now all starting to be banned by DEFRA and other, econ uh, other governments around the world is because their use phase is so short. So there's a lot of energy goes into their production and their lifetime is seconds, if minute, maybe minutes. So those products need to be kept in use. OK, so by doing that, we're starting to extend their life. Every time you extend something's life, by default, you reduce its impact. So fast fashion is another good example. Um, if you buy three T-shirts a year because they, you know, you want to change fashion versus buying one T-shirt that lasts you the whole year. So that would be another example. You can extrapolate it up. So if you start to think about your own products and what you're doing, you know, how long do they last? Can they be repaired? Can they be reused? You'll start to, to, to think about that. So I'm going to take um, a quick Q&A just on what we've covered. I've got a question from Andre. Uh, it's just as good. Questions? Uh, sorry, uh, it was that one. I'll come back to Robert. So the circular economy concept seems cumbersome and complex. Uh, will this be actually be implemented? Not being closed-minded, just asking about potential ties. Yeah, it may do. I'm trying to help simplify it, Andre. Um, I think you're right about the big diagrams. Truthfully. Um, you know, the world is a very complex place. Um, ecosystems are very complex. There's a lot going on. I think we've ignored that pretty much. So we've um, operated in a very uh, linear manner. So we've gone oil, uh, you know, materials, make it, use it, dispose of it. We haven't taken in, you're absolutely right, any of that complexity, um, any of those what we sometimes call externalities. So the external cost for the growth and the economies that we have had has been borne by both society and the environment. So yes, I think it is cumbersome a little bit, but I think it's something that will evolve. The circular economy concept has only really been around since the very late 80s academically, the 90s in more of a, um, you know, a sort of economic sense. So as with everything, it's evolving. But I think if you think about something like recycling, pretty much everyone gets that now. They get the concept of not throwing stuff in landfill. Um, so we're starting to work back from that side, saying, look, actually, recycling should be our new low point. That's our bare minimum. What we need to do is push up the waste hierarchy. If any of you are familiar with that, you push up through reuse and reduce. So there are quite a lot of different con uh, uh, concepts. Will it be actually implemented? Well, it is being implemented in several countries. So China have a very strong circular economy program, have had for years. Um, so, has, so have Korea, Germany, the Netherlands are really pushing ahead. But even here in the UK, we have circular cities in Glasgow and Edinburgh. We have quite a bit of activity in London. We have circular plans for Bristol. So at a city level, people are starting to implement this um, as, a, as a new way of, of kind of looking at the economy. A uh, question here from Robert. Electrical waste, recycling repair is a huge international problem. Uh, he's just telling us um, about bookmarking uh, UE safe. Brilliant. Thanks, Robert. OK, I'll carry on. So what does this mean to you as an SME? So, Funny enough, our first question there was um, about this perception that it's complicated. And I, you know, I'm often asked to talk about building the business case for circular economy. So um, is it high risk? You know, is it high investment? It's not proven. It's great theory, but difficult. to implement. This is a quite a common perception. But the reality is 
very different. This may have been how we felt about this sort of thing in the 90s or even the turn of the century 20 years ago when I started out um, in this field. But now if you look at, and these are just a few snippets I took from the news probably over the last two months, most large companies and investment um, organisations and, in, and indeed governments are now looking at this as the future. So it's not a kind of pie in the sky type idea. The reason being, A, the environmental pressure, um, the, 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 the awakening around climate change, but also the supply chain issues I mentioned. So whilst you're, whilst you're mining and using and discarding, you know, there's a lost opportunity there and your business model can only be kind of ever decreasing. Um, and obviously businesses want to grow. So they're now seeing it sort of growth by retaining some of the value from those products. So Pandora only using recycled gold and silver and now actually using um, a, a different type of diamond, you know, a, a diamond that's not been mined, so a, a synthetic diamond. 20% of all fashion to be rented by 2025. That's a real change. Um, so the reality is quite different. So what's the opportunities for you? Um, really important that we build this in right at the bottom in terms of your uh, business models and your financial models. Awareness around sustainability from consumers cannot be underestimated. I've never That's really seen anything like it in the 25 years I've been doing this. But the growth in the uh, desire and the willingness to pay for more sustainable products is massive. And that's everything from veganism all the way up to electric cars, all the way to renewable fuel and all that sort of thing. Um, so if you're looking to grow markets, you would want to look to expand into this space, particularly the younger market, which is going to be the high, you know, the high end consumers of the future. And loyalty. There's lots and lots that says you need to gain trust. And you, you don't need, you need to look at the papers about the, the amount of distrust that is around um, fossil based industries. Thing. And it's not to say you need to move away from that, but you need to say, we get it, we understand the problems, and this is what we're going to try and do about it. That in turn improves your reputation. I mentioned supply chain risks, which is all about a short supply chain is a good supply chain. But if you don't know where things are coming from, you can't fully understand their impact. You can't be transparent to your customer, which, again, reputational and loyalty risk. So the clients I'm working with are really building this in um, to how they market, to how they um, design their product, to how they speak to their customers, to how they engage um, and, you know, how they innovate and how they show that they are on top of this issue. Um, and they're, you know, differentiated from their, from their um, competitors. So start looking through a new lens, a circular lens. You kind of know that all this stuff's going around, on around you. We know that we're part of it. We're part of the problem, but we are part of the solution. So treat this, if you like, and people do regard it as such, as a, as a fourth industrial revolution. So we went through a massive change to get into the last revolu industrial revolution. And this is just us evolving again to realize that we can't just carry on like that. We won't have a healthy economy. We can't have a healthy economy without a healthy society and without a healthy environment. So we need to start saying that, you know, the purpose of business is, is for social benefit. It's also to leave the environment in a better state than we found it. We sometimes talk about doubling resource productivity, but that's really closing the gap between growth um, and, and resource use. So at the moment, resource use goes up, so does um, growth goes up, sorry, so does resource use, so does emissions, so does everything. We need to uh, try and sort of reverse that trend. So in a circular economy, resources are maintained in utility at their highest value for as long as possible. Okay, so starting to think about that. Um, okay, any more questions? Is there, I'm just going to take this question from Oh, I'm going to take that at the end, Robert, about the silver bullet. OK, so I'm going to come on to circular business models. Now, I've chosen examples only from SMEs, OK, um, because I'll come on to that in a minute, because uh, we're all um, used to seeing and hearing things from Ikea and um, Coca-Cola and Unilever and Ben and Jerry's. And all these people. But I, this presentation is for SMEs. OK, so 
I'll come on to that. Um, but I just wanted you to know that I've particularly focused on SMEs. So what is the problem? OK, the percentages here. And if we were in a room, we'd do this in a bit more interactive way. But the percentages here show you the um, the uh, average time that the usage time for these um, items. Actually, one of them is a reverse. So the average usage time for a drill in its entire life is 13 minutes. OK. Um, 69 percent of food is used. So that means the rest is wasted. 92 percent of um, your vehicle time is stationary. OK. And again, these are very gross figures. But if you think about it, they're either stuck on your driveway um, or they're their useful life is very short. Um, and 60 percent of buildings are in use. OK. I'm not actually sure if that's used for the time or whether that's use of the, of the building stock. So what I'm trying to say here is why would you own a drill when you only need one for 13 minutes every 10 years or whatever it is when you could borrow one? Why would simply would you own a car when it's only in use for 8% of its time? And so you can see that's how we've got into a bit of a situation with so much consumption, but actually quite low usage rates. So we're, we're consuming more than we're, we're actually able to maintain. So circular business models, this is kind of where it all becomes a bit more applied. So um, how do we do it? Um, I mentioned circular design. So design for circularity is at the beginning. But if you don't design your product, you, you, you may be a retailer or you may be a service sector company. Lots of things around the outside you can look at. And I'm going to throw out some resources for those. One of the main reasons I one of the main thing I try and get across with circular economy is it is all around us already it's not a new thing and a lot of people go back and say we used to do this we used to do that but the majority of cars are leased now not owned lots and lots of people buy very expensive mobile phones on a lease they don't own them we share stuff amongst ourselves on Facebook our families our friends all the time lots of us repair and maintain things you know, so actually it's not that difficult. What's difficult is trying to get this into a business model sense so that we're actually planning to do it rather than ad hoc. Leasing has actually been around for for decades. You know, that's not something that's that's difficult for people to get their head around. But what is difficult is to try and get a business to say, I currently sell one off. Could I uh, change to a lease model? OK. So here's a good example, ACS up in Scotland. So they provide the infrastructure for clothing hire. Uh, they do the, the um, cleaning, they clean by ozone and they, they pack and they send it out and all the rest of it. So they facilitate this growth in clothing hire. They used to do wedding wear, kilts, that sort of thing. Tiny kind of niche business, absolutely flying. They're taking on new customers all the time. So traditionally, these, these fashion companies, and a lot of them are quite small and quite new. They would have been selling these clothes one off. They know that economic downturn hits their business. They've moved into higher. Um, so this is a really, really growth market. So there's lots of reasons why that makes sense. And it's staying thing actually repair and refurbish. Zipyard is a, a franchise um, across the UK and Ireland where um, clothes can be taken for repair, for for alteration, that sort of thing, keeps them in use for longer, really, really successful. It's growing really, really quick. So you will all be saying, well, we used to have these, you know, people used to take stuff up and all the rest of it. It's coming back. On the reuse side, one of the things people find is they need more support with what items are where, um, you know, when I can pick them up, what they cost, what they don't cost, that sort of thing. And one of the first companies I worked with was Globe Chain. And they um, have got a platform. It's now the biggest online reuse platform. It's a bit like um, a, a bit like e eBay, but you don't have to. It's not the same sort of thing. You're not buying and selling. You're reusing and, and swapping. So surplus items. Um, they've got a lot of retailers, for example. If they refit, they'll get rid of all the racking and that sort of thing. Previously would have gone in the skip. But now it'll go surplus to, to uh, another shop that's starting up or wants it or a charity. That sort of thing. So really nice. Again, very successful, small and very. Company. This company um, is I find fascinating. So they remanufacture medical devices. Um, again, this is not news. Absolutely widespread in Germany and the US, and it never stopped after the war. 
they just kept it going. For some reason in the UK, we went down the disposable route um, <clears throat> and, and, um, um, and, you know, it's been really successful ever since. So they're trying to launch that in the UK. Saving money and saving carbon. I'm just going to get a drink. Sorry. There we go. Really good example. Has, has to be clinically proven, has to be all CE marked, has to be equal cost or cheaper. But a really good example, there's platinum tip in these disposable devices. So getting them back makes a lot of sense. A couple of nice examples around um, reuse and recycling. So toast ale, uh, make beer out of bread. A really nice kind of marketing link up there. Again, really strong cred environmental credentials there and palite i'm actually sitting on a palite desk now um it's a set up to make desks for, for offices or even families um schooling from home that sort of thing um out of cardboard easy to recycle so if you think about the home office thing that's happened the amount of office equipment that's gone into homes as people go back to the offices that may a lot of that may become redundant recycled just that these from tweets um, and they both come from my CE100 series. So I'm working my, my way through. I'm on about 40 at the moment. So if you want to see some more, um, go on to LinkedIn. Find that, that hashtag there. And they're all companies that um, that I think are doing a really good of, job of circular economy. And finally, um, I just wanted to put this one up here. You can even share a dog. OK, so you can share just about anything. Tools is a good example. Airbnb is an example. Car sharing. But if you wanted to, in your business, you could maximise your asset, creating some way of sharing them or hiring them or renting them out. And just to, to sort of emphasise that point, if you can sell a product once, a power drill, for example, why wouldn't you want to sell that product two or three times or five or ten times? OK, so rather than selling it once and then having to work really hard to get another client with rental with subscription with all these sorts of circular systems you get it back you might have to do some refurb to it you might not have to do anything to it apart from clean it and you can rent it out again so you have this customer loyalty so if you think about a car sharing scheme uh, car sharing members go back and they're paying probably monthly and you've got a different type of um revenue a different type of income but a much more secure one and a much more uh, circular one, an environmentally sound one. So sharing economy is just on its way up, um, but there's, a lo again, loads and loads of examples. Uber's another good example of sharing economy. So I think we're going to try a second poll. Um, bear with us on the tech. So I'm going to ask you guys now, what would help you accelerate your own transition to a more to more circular business model. So if you were to think about this in your own business, and I'm not aware what you're all in, but if you're in manufacturing, if you're in insurance, if you're in advice, think of it from what you're in. What would help you to accelerate your transition to more circular business models? Um, and would that be one-to-one -one support? Do you need help from external people? Would that be collaboration? Because most of these models rely on at least supply chain collaboration, but it might be things like university collaboration as well. Would things like more global measures like taxation help? So there's a plastics tax coming on virgin plastic, for example. Would that you know, level the playing field and help you? Or would having greater consumer awareness of waste and circularity help you the most? So, four to choose from. Uh, Sorry, I was just going to say that I can see there are some answers coming into the post poll. Oh, right, good. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the answers, Emma, but on my no, screen, 
What have you got, um, Steve? Okay, so one-to-one -one support and training from experts is currently scoring nothing, mm -hmm. whereas collaboration and partnerships is up there at 60%. And Ooh. then the other, the other two have both got low scores, 20%. That's the taxation one and greater consumer awareness. Great. So collaboration Good. is the one that people are looking for. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Well, that's good news for universities then. Um, and we are seeing a, a, a lot more collaboration. Now, if things like uh, UK Innovate Fund, they require collaboration. Um, things like, you know, citywide schemes. Absolutely. And and you, it's, I'm not saying it's impossible to do it in isolation, but every single company I work with um, has collaborated on their circular business model. Because I think as the question was raised at the beginning, it's quite complex. You can't possibly be the expert on everything but if you're going to do something like a return scheme or repair you'd be much better to outsource that or have someone to do the logistics for that washing for example of cups a bit like ACS you know they collaborate with the clothing hiring companies to uh, to get that clothing back from the consumer washed and cleaned and back to the to the brand or retailer really good example okay so I'm just going to go into the sort of final section before we take some more Q&A. Um, the key ingredients and behaviours then um, about circular economy. So this is more about kind of, you know, the how we do it. So we've we've looked at the, the what it is and the why. We've looked at the models, and I appreciate that was quite a quick <coughs> trot through. But if you're looking at this in your own business, what are the sort of key key ingredients that you need and really it's about decision making and I would say it's very similar to how we're starting to think about climate change or carbon okay so all of the innovation you do all of the decisions that you do that involve any resource think about them from a circular lens so do I need to buy this could I rent it if I rent it is it you know am I going to get it serviced um, do I need to sell this in this way? How do I create a more circular relationship with my customer? How do I get them back? Which ironically is what every, you know, every marketeer uh, is trained to do. But if they have to come back to you because of servicing or you say, I'll take that back from you at the end of life, you've, you've got them, you know, that you've got their loyalty. So moving from ownership towards service is really um, a real crux of sort of how to think about these, these business models. You will need to be tenacious and think outside the box. So lots of the great examples we're seeing are really quite creative. They're taking um, examples from other industries and pulling them across. Um, so I use Airbnb as a classic example. You know, it wasn't designed to be what it is now. Um, so um, it wasn't the first idea. Um, but they, it evolved into that. So it might be that you think about, um, well, we produce, um, let's say, we produce um, alarm clocks. But we might do a rental service for alarm clocks. But you run a business um, case, um, you build a business case for that, and it doesn't seem to stack up. You test it on the consumer, and they say, we don't want to rent an alarm clock. It's not what we want to do. But what we would do to buy an alarm clock that we knew at the end of its life, we could send it back and we'd get a voucher off a new one, or we'd get it repaired or whatever, great. So having this sort of deep understanding of that's what you want to do, but also accepting that you're going to need a bit of trial and error and trying to get close to your customers to see what they need and what the next trends are is really where you need to be resourceful and sort of not, you know, not give up at the first, first hurdle. This market is moving so fast. Uh, particularly you know, sort of age group, sort of 15 to 25, 35, um, really, really engaged in much, much more um, open business models and sharing and higher and that sort of thing than the previous generation were. So we need to have an open mind. And, you know, this cooperation thing is really, really true. And it comes into my final point here, look outside, you know, look outside of your business, see whether someone's doing something in another business that you could transfer. So I use the car example for leasing and the mobile phone example. They've been doing that for years. They sort of cottoned on that people aspire to own 
high value items, but can't uh, or, do, or don't want to pay for those items outright. So how can they have that aspiration uh, without paying up front? So they can have that aspiration by uh, renting that item. So um, there are lots and lots of examples out there. Good, okay. So back to simple principles. Rethinking your purpose. So that's an overarching issue. You know, what's the purpose of your business? What are you trying to achieve? What um, legacy are you leaving through the products that you supply or the services that you supply? And rethinking your business model. So trying to think of yourself more as a regenerative business, not a not a here today, gone tomorrow business. So a longer term view. What's our role, if you like, in a circular economy, in a, a carbon aware economy? So once you've done that thinking, then starting to kind of reduce elements in your supply chain. And you can do this by your a lot of people have done that through lean and other things. But I'm working with businesses now who are starting to do this in their supply chain. So they're saying, we don't want to receive this item in this packaging. OK, uh, there are even people who've got together as the whole sector and gone, we don't want to receive this in this packaging. Find a way. Right. We'll find a way together. Collaborate. So you're now starting to see whole supply chains getting together and saying, well, we thought we needed to do this because. But if you're saying we don't, then we could do it a different way and starting to redesign, you know, the supply chain. So things like reusable transit packaging becoming very, very common. Um, things like using trackable device devices for, for reuse. So you know where, where your product is, how long someone's got it, when it's going to come back, all that sort of thing. So starting to do things like that can reduce the resources that are in play. So you don't just keep making. So you're trying to deliver the best you can with with the least impact so that might mean that you look at how your product can do other things you know multi-purpose things you might have seen that more and more companies are starting to look at refill and reuse um, particularly in supermarkets but there are lots and lots of other ways of looking at, at that as well and in reuse i would put things like remanufacture and repurposing and refurbishing so um, a, another company a bit bigger than SME, but not enormous, Stanner Stair Lifts. They uh, take back stair lifts and they refurbish them and they sell them at almost the same price point as the new ones. That gives the same guarantee. guarantee all that sort of thing. So they, were, well, they worked out that um, their stair lifts, which are high value items, were being sold on eBay when they weren't needed anymore. Um, so they decided if they could be sold on eBay, then they would be they could get them back and resell them, but with guarantees. Um, so that's a really good example of reuse extending to remanufacture. Uh, Sky did the same with their sky boxes. So sky boxes used to be um, almost a disposable item. You know, they'd send you a new one, and you'd say, "What do I do with it?" And they'd say, "Well, do what you like with it." Now they take them back because they realised that they were being sold on eBay. And they um, take them apart. They've, re they've redesigned the box so that it can be upgradable, modular, um, and they'll use them again. You know, so there's a really good example of selling a skybox once, or selling a skybox two or three times with the same core materials, just updated. So it's a bit of a no-brainer when you can when you when you consider the economics. You obviously have to factor in the logistics of getting it back and all that sort of stuff. And finally, down at the bottom, and there's a reason why this is at the bottom. So I want you to go back to where we started, which was thinking about recycling, not as the answer, but really as the as the base level. But it is really important to start to think about um, recycled content, where your product ends up. If it's an electronic product, you'll already be thinking about this because of the Wii regs. If it's packaging, you'll probably be already be thinking about it anyway. But lots of other things, you know, what, what is it that you make and where does it end up? And what could you what could you change to make that uh, flow more easily into the recycling infrastructure? There is a lot of movement at the moment around biodegradable packaging. Um, it's really early days for that sort of thing. And I put in brackets and probably should put in 
big bold letters where infrastructure exists so um not a silver bullet at the moment but something to keep an eye on particularly if you work in food where your packaging is 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 going to be um you know close to a compost bin um or, or a couple of other areas where that where that does work out so coming back to um just to try and wrap up and then i'll take some questions for the last 10 minutes there's a competitive advantage we've we've sort of covered why there's an environmental advantage and even if we haven't had time to cover the social advantage but socially i should just say the circular economy by its very nature offers a lot more jobs than a linear economy because it's service driven so it relies on humans getting stuff back uh, refurbishing it repairing it okay and not just to Centre uses high-skilled humans. So a lot of those skills that we've lost or are losing. So, so um, it's not just environmental; it's social as well. I think that's really important to remember. Looking forward to the green recovery or, or sort of growing our economy. But from your business point of view, if you start to think about your competitive advantage against your competitors, just wanted to revisit this. Eliminating the concept of waste, okay? So not just assuming it all goes away in a black bag and that's that. Everything you have sold, once it's sold, it has still got a value. Now, whether that value is to you is, up to, is your choice, really. Whether you can make a second life out of that is, is, your, is your business model. That's your choice. Once you wave goodbye to it, on a linear model, it is gone. It leaks. Remember that, that, that arrow? It's just leaked out and it's all sitting in a landfill somewhere. So if you can start to think about getting product back in train, whether it's you or whether it's a partner down the line, that's creating value. So the second point is about moving on from incremental efficiency gains. So this was the energy efficiency, resource efficiency of the 90s and, and turn of the century. Really, really important, but only really scratching the surface. Now, circular economy offers us the opportunity to change the system. So I think that's you need both. But given that massive carbon challenge we've got, we're not going to hit that with incremental 5% improvements here and there. We're not going to do it. We need to change the system. <clears throat> we need to be looking at 30, 40, 50% gains. So to do that, I would encourage you to forge a deep bond with your customers and get to know what they want and i would say almost across the board every time i get involved with the survey people say we want more sustainable products that's what they want we want good products and we want the right quality and right price but we want them to be more sustainable so there's a really big opportunity here for you to lead on this and finally if you are involved or not involved or want to collaborate the thing i would advise you is to collaborate on digital so Again, the next kind of solution, but to, to, to keep an eye on these assets, to understand their value, we need to be able to track them. So we need to know what they're worth in year one, what they're worth after three years, um, how we're going to get them back. Um, so in this, this technology, this Internet of Things is uh, evolving at such a rate. So most of the reuse companies I'm, I'm working with are in using um, RFID tags or QR codes and all that sort of digital tech. Otherwise, we do risk this out of sight, out of mind. We've sold a thousand of these. I have no idea where they've gone. How on earth do you expect me to get them back? OK, so start to try and think about where are we to track our item? What would we want to track and, you know, uh, and what platform would we want to use? It doesn't need to be super expensive. These things are becoming very commonplace now. So that's a good one on, the, on back on the collaboration. And just to take home messages before we do the last set of uh, last poll and last bit of Q&A. Going back to understanding your circular mindset, and I call it a mindset because it's not a sort of set of it's not a checklist. It's not a set of rights and wrongs. It's about seeing things in a different way. OK, so once you get your head around that mindset and if you want any other resources to read around, um, you know, do get in touch with me and send me a, an email. I'm happy to send you reading lists and that sort of thing. But trying to marry circular economy with carbon is really something that's starting to be really important now. And it's most of my work, actually, is trying to understand where circular economy fits into net zero. So we need to do that at the same time. 
taking your part of the responsibility. I think we're all here for that reason, but it goes without saying that you can ask other people to do that too. You can ask your supply chains and you can ask your customers, you know, what are we going to do about this together? And then using that information to enhance your service, to make it more so. Collaborate, we've said a lot of times, and try not to get left behind. <laughs> Start now. So I'm going to just run the last poll before I put my details up if anyone wants them. Louise, would you be able to put um, the last poll up, which will basically help tell me whether you've picked up any information or not? Um, would moving to more circular business models benefit your business? So what do you think, basically? Do you think greatly? I can see loads of opportunities. Do you think a little? It might help us compete. Do you think not much? Mm, there isn't enough demand? Or do you think not at all? Doesn't feel relevant to us at all. So how do you feel about your own business? Would moving to a more secret business model benefit you? Steve, would you be able to, when the results come in, would you be able to this? Yes, I was just waiting to see if any more results are going to come in. Yeah, take a minute. Uh, because at the moment, uh, I can't actually tell how many. Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, several people have voted. So yeah. we can take the results as they are now. And the results are uh, for greatly, I can see lots of opportunities 100%. So really? I don't need to read fabulous. <laughs> That's great. Oh, well, that's a resounding success. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Well, I'm going to go over to the Q&A now. Um, so a question here from Robert. Uh, do you think that getting goods back to the manufacturer is removing local work opportunities? And as a subscription model, it's a restricted practice. Yeah, you can be forced, in, you can be forced in to repair as that are expensive. Yeah, uh, also does ties up disposable income by leasing or renting everything. Really, I think there's a couple of questions in there, Robert. Really, really interesting. One of the things of sector economy is decentralizing, so or, or localizing, if you like. So moving away from this kind of um, global, you know, global supply chain or national distribution center and everything has to go back there. So I'm 100% with you. I think we need to think about local skills. I uh, really like the, the franchise model of Zipyard, for example. So they're in cities, so a bit like Timpsons. So there are some really good examples where, um, you know, uh, people are trained locally. Uh, and I think that's, you know, really, really important. Do subscriptions tie up um, disposable income? You'd have to ask an economist. But um, I think what they do do is they make more premium things uh and i'm thinking about white goods here actually robert i think you're involved in um in electrical sector um so they do make higher value items which can tend to be more sustainable uh more accessible to people so i'm working with a white goods company at the moment we've been trial trying for about three or five years actually to get leasing um, into white goods sector because we believe that would be a cheaper a cheaper way in for more um, lower income households. So they'd get a higher value machine, they'd get um, a warranty, they'd get it repaired, it would be safe, um, it could be upgraded, all those sorts of things for a monthly fee uh, rather than going to have to buy a five or six hundred pound machine outright. Um, so yeah, I I, th I think on balance those models are beneficial. Yeah, if, I um, could pick, if, if I could just pick that one up, Emma. I, I yeah, think great. The, uh, one of the Emma, uh, Ellen MacArthur's uh, case studies uh, is a company in the Netherlands that does exactly that. They're called Bundles and they lease. Yeah, they yeah, uh, no, yeah. um, I think they're still going. They were last time I looked. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're making a, a, a bit of a success out of that, as far as I can tell. Yeah, um, there's a much more of a culture of it there. So, um, you know, we have an ownership culture in the UK, although that is changing. So you're, it, it tends to follow, you know, uh, house ownership, moving to rental. 
uh, car ownership move into leasing. So it's just that it, it takes a while for it to filter down to smaller and smaller items. That's so, great. you know, yeah, it's very difficult to lease. You can rent items in the UK and people will be familiar with Bright House. Um, but that model is all about, um, you know, the cost of finance. That's, that's not, a, you know, a, a socially helpful yeah, yeah, model. That's, that's um, I'm just going to take the last question here, I think. And sorry if I've missed you, anybody. Um, is there one silver bullet which you could summarize? What my number one message would be wow what a great question <laughs> gosh uh circular economy and smes what's the silver bullet um i'll give you an answer if you what, you can comment on mine <laughs> you know, i would say there, there is no, no way say so your product do not does not just disappear at its end of life so think about that and if you want your customers to come back to you create a circular economy business model create a create a circular business model and they will have to come back so best way to retain customers is through circular business models steve what were you thinking uh, yeah I, i'm thinking along similar lines but partly from having listened to you of course so i was thinking <laughs> we, we need to start to understand waste in a different way at the moment waste seems like uh, it's a bad thing we tend to throw it away but if we mm -hmm. think of it as surplus material that has value and if we know that we're all on one planet and there's no such place as away mm -hmm. uh, then we can make something of it and make some business out of it that should be a more natural way that's that's fantastic Stephen. when you think about it it's it's mad you know i often say the person who invented the black bin bag has a lot to answer for because <laughs> <laughs> once you put something in a black bin bag you know it's it's effectively valueless isn't it but you open that black bin bag and it's full of gold and silver you know, um, so, you know, if anyone's looked in the skip, <laughs> they'll know that's <laughs> value. But it, but it's about creating, it's very difficult to do that, you know, once the stuff's in the skip. It's about stepping back and saying, uh, before it gets to the skip, let's design it so that it can be stripped out of the building and reused. And this is starting to happen, even for things like PVC windows. So, but yeah. there's a lot of work that has to be done at the front end um, before we, you know, before things uh, can be, the waste can be designed out, if you like. This, yeah, exactly the way Absolutely. to do it. Uh, Emma, I think that was an excellent session, and I'm right. just conscious of time. Yeah, we're wrapping you, up. You, you have achieved 100% of the respondents saying they can see lots of opportunities. <laughs> done My job is done. Most exteriorly. Uh, so let me thank Emma Burlow for a marvellous session, uh, and our technical support right. as well, Louise, for looking after us. Um, yes. and encourage everyone to click over to our closing session, which is, it's the end of the world as we know it, not the end of the world. Um, and that's starting just about now. So I'll Thanks see you all there. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.